Hi everyone, thanks for joining the session today. Today we are going to talk about cryptography. Why do we need it? What are the root uh, encryption mechanisms? What are the elements and functions used to encrypt the data? How cryptography can be of help in securing the applications or data? What are the some of uh, what are some of the additional terms used in cryptography? So let's get straight to the topic. We are going to talk about confidentiality, authenticity, uh, authentication, integrity, non-replication. Uh, we'll touch upon cryptography uh, and what is asymmetric uh, cryptography, symmetric cryptography, digital signatures, a bit about key distribution and certification. So now, uh, what is confidentiality? Before that, I'll explain encryption. Uh, encryption is a method or algorithm for transforming a simple plain text uh, which is not encrypted in the plain text, the word you're seeing on in front of uh, the screen, into cipher text, which is encrypted text, which is uh, the text which people might not understand if they don't know the algorithm. So uh, confidentiality makes sure that uh, the data remains private in all the forms possible. Data when it's in rest, which is stored somewhere on a database or lying somewhere on a server, in transit or in motion or when we are transferring the data. At that time, data remains safe. Nobody is able to sniff it. Nobody is able to do the man in the middle and uh, listen to what we are speaking. So if I'm speaking to um, any of the person in the group and uh, somebody else is able to hear it, that, that, confident, that information is not confidential. Or for example, if I'm speaking with one of my friends, and somebody listens to it, the, the data does not remain confidential. So confidentiality ensures the data in at rest, uh, in transit, when it's in motion, when it's flowing, and when it's in use. If we are using the data at that time also, uh, it should be confidential to the people who is supposed to know it, not anyone and everyone. So uh, confidentiality, perhaps the most widely cited goal for a crypto system uh, or cryptography because we have to make uh, the information that we are dealing with is secure even the keys we will look at the keys in the upcoming uh, uh, portions that it's very very important to keep the keys confidential Going ahead authentication now, what is authentication? Authentication makes sure the person uh, who's, whom I am talking to is the right person or the person who is who's trying to access the system, is the person is the right person. For example, I'll um, give you a demo. There is a communication between Alice and Bob. Bob says, I am Bob, okay? Alice says, prove it and encrypt Apple. Bob knows the system, okay. Now I'm the right person and I know the alpha. So, alpha. Alice says, yes. Hi, Bob, I authenticate you, you're the right person, you know the answer. For example, uh, when we log into any of the email system, when we log into any social media, or even for our organization system, how do we get authenticated? Because there is a credential that, that uh, there are credentials that have been given to us, even for your college system. If there is a uh, there is a username and password for your email system that has been given to you, so it's authenticated to you. Or if we go to offices, we go to colleges, there is an ID card that's been given to us. Without your ID badge, you wouldn't be allowed to enter into the organizations or colleges or anywhere where you are not supposed to. That's authentication. Uh, what is integrity? Integrity means that we are not altering the information. The on, uh, information, as we send it to one, uh, one person to another, it remains as is. There's no alteration. If you've heard of Chinese whisper, if I tell you something, you tell further, it keeps on uh, decreasing or the, uh, the information keeps on changing. That shouldn't be the case. The moment the information changes, the integrity is lost. So data is not altered without any authorization. So integrity checks can ensure that the stored data uh, is not altered between the time it was stored or between the time it was transmitted to someone. 
till the end person reaches it till the end person starts reading it so it's very very important to maintain the integrity especially if uh, for example you upload some pictures on instagram and somebody removes it or somebody moves it to something or put some filters on it is it going to be an integrity maintained no the integrity is altered because somebody could access your system and change the things that you uploaded or you get changes your messages someone changes your post that's an integrity loss and it's very very important to keep the integrity intact so uh, how we can actually attain it or uh, how we can make sure that the data is not altered we have to make sure that we are encrypting it properly and then there's a message that i just that i'm going to talk about that how we can make sure that uh, data you stored and the data you have is the same moving on non repudiation uh, what is non repudiation if i sent a message to kranti if i sent a message to um, xyz person the information remains uh, uh, as is but i cannot say that i have not sent it like i cannot de deny that if i have sent the message there is a proof that i have uh, sent the email or i have uh, sent uh, i have posted you the messages so all of that remains as is there is an integrity but then uh, there is signature that maintains that or a time stamp or uh, there is some unique uniqueness the person who is sending it cannot deny it any cost even if a person is sending a malicious form or from that id that has been sent the person cannot deny that the person did not send it it could be the reason the credentials are lost but in simple ways you can uh, uh, just think about it as that if uh, x person has sent information to y person y person will think that it's only being sent by the x person an x person later can uh, come back and cannot say that no i did not send it no that's not possible so uh, non repudiation ensures that and these are the few terminologies which we will keep during plain text which is the text in the common form if you can see on the screen cipher text which is the encrypted text or encrypted information that's called cipher text one when we change uh, one form to another from plain text to cipher text a uh, key is the one word that we will keep hearing like when you add a uh, key to plain text it becomes cipher text or uh, uh, the things that we will use to change plain text into cipher text okay we understand that encryption uses plain text cipher text keys now what is cryptanalysis so cryptanalysis is a form wherein uh, people are trying to secure the information people are trying to use the algorithms to maintain the data secure the analysts they make sure people make sure that we break those uh, cryptographic algorithms if there is a password uh, which is stored in some form somewhere and we break that um, uh, that's called cryptanalysis that's why there are new algorithms that keep coming in and there are en en enhancements that keep happening and who does it there are um, uh, researchers who do it there are uh, defense forces who keep doing that and then there are people who specifically work as cryptanalysis uh, analysts who keep breaking those algorithms and say now this is being broken now there has to be something which is new that has to come into picture because once there's something that gets break then only the new algorithms comes into picture and what is key space so key space is number of possible different uh, keys that can be available for encryption and decryption so let's say if there are there's a key space of uh, four so there can be six, six possible uh, different keys that can be available uh this is just for your understanding now we deep dive into symmetric key cryptography now what is symmetric key and why are we specifically highlighting symmetric key cryptography and why do we even talk about it now why do we say that this is symmetric key and this is this has to be symmetric key algorithm so symmetric key algorithm rely on a shared secret encryption key so there is only one key Uh, let's say i am talking to someone a, a friend of mine we have the same key exchange already 
and we know the similar key. So if I send information to my friend, they will know, okay, yes, it's being sent by uh, Mandara, mm -hmm. and now I'm going to uh, decrypt it using the same key. So this key is used by all the parties. Even if I'm sending the information to all of my friends, they will be using the same key to decrypt the message. So in this case, it encrypts it with the shared secret key and the receiver also decrypts it with the same key. So what happens with when there are keys which are large sized? If the keys are very large sized, it will be different, uh, difficult to break. For example, Cipher, Caesar Cipher, if I have to start uh, from Caesar Cipher. So when you start learning about encryption or even cryptography, this is the first thing that comes into everyone's mind. One of the earliest known uh, Cipher text used by Julius Caesar to come in the uh, Caesario in Rome. So Caesar Cipher is a simple substitution algorithm that merely shifted the plain text over three places. If you can see, if I have A, B, C, D, E, F, so D will be changed to A. So that will be the substitution. Uh, that will be the Caesar that will be using. So if I have to encrypt, I'll change the, the word by three or the letter by three alphabets. And if I have to decrypt, I will do the same thing. And same thing will be used here. Now, what else is there? Substitution cipher. So substitution uh, cipher is almost a similar thing wherein uh, it's using a mono alphabetic cipher wherein we change one alphabet by one number and uh, we change the plain text to the cipher, uh, cipher text. If you can see, Alice was converted to MGSBC, but how was it done? A was converted to M. So we change the places for multiple alphabets. But if you can see in scissor cipher, we just changed it which is uh, mod 3, which has changed it by that in uh, mod 26. And we could see we could see that there are alphabets and the meaning, the syphotics is getting changed. So there can be multiple other things that can play a role. Right now we're talking one letter getting changed that's called monoalphabetic, but they can be polo al poly, uh, polyalphabetic. Now, what is polyalphabetic and I'm all, talking all jargons. So polyalphabetic is wherein we use plain text, we use key, and then we combine them. Let's say there is a huge list of alphabets. We write down A to Z multiple times, and we check, uh, we write down a plain text underneath key, and then wherever they coincide. So let's say A and S, they coincide at some place called T. So now we are not uh, using the uh, alphabets which are so obvious to guess because cipher text was so obvious to guess. Anyone who starts looking at the pattern would understand. Similarly, with this kind of a pattern, people will start uh, understanding, okay, this is the pattern. But in poly alphabets, it's, it's pretty uh, difficult to guess, okay, now how we will have to write down and then understand where exactly it's going to be coinciding. These kind of attacks, uh, uh, like polyalphabetic attacks, can actually help us uh, removing all those frequent attacks. It, because I will, uh, my brain goes in, how, what is the rhythm of this particular alphabet? Is there something that is changed? Especially all those uh, questions that come in um, MCQs, and uh, those are easy to guess. Like, I can change alphabet numbers, even the uh, numbers, I will guess it. So all those attacks can be avoided with uh, the poly alphabetic substitution. Now, coming back to the symmetric key cryptography. Now, when there is one key being used, the key is being used from, uh, there's a plain text. We encrypt it using the encryption key. It becomes a cipher text. Now, the cipher text is being used to decrypt it because the other person has to decrypt it. So if Alice has sent some information to Bob, Bob will use the same key to decrypt it to understand that the cipher text, how do you understand? If I'm sending it to someone, the other person has to understand it in the plain uh, language. So when we add key to plain text, it becomes cipher text. Now, this is the formula to obtain the keys, number of keys. How will you define that number of keys is being defined by this formula? 
So n is the number of key and then n minus 1 into n minus 1 by 2. Remember that we are going to going to explain this formula in the uh, upcoming slides, but I just wanted to point it out here. And not to miss, sender and will have the same key in the symmetric key. So there's only one key being used from one person to another. So here uh, I have explained again that what could be the thing. I am trying to encrypt a message uh, with the key. It becomes a ciphertext. I'm trying to decrypt the uh, message with the key or the, uh, the ciphertext with the key and that becomes a message. So message is the key here, but if you see the key is the same. And if I want the data uh, from the ciphertext, it's going to use the same key all across. There are different algorithms which are being used by symmetric key, which keep getting enhanced and uh, which keeps on getting uh, modified over the years. So the first one was DES, which is data encryption standard. And when we started using DES, there were uh, there were issues because it was using the block size, which was 64 bit, but the key was 56 bit. Now, what was the, what could go wrong if the key size is 56 bit? Now, uh, if we say 56 bit as short of the key, it's easy to guess it. It's easy to break the algorithm. So we have to have a bigger algorithm, bigger key in that. So not to miss that if you're using a bigger size key, it will be difficult to break. Now, when DES is using a 64 bit block, it has five modes of operation. So it uses different modes of operation like electronic code block, cipher block chaining, cipher feedback, output uh, feedback, and counter mode. So these are different modes which are being used. Uh, there will be few places which where will you will be uh, checking that this is using a 64-bit key. No, it's not using 64-bit key, but a fixed 56-bit uh, symmetric key. And the rest of the uh, sizes, which is 8-bit, is for the parity check. Now, uh, we, uh, we will be talking about bit size and block in all the slides. So block is where the data is being encrypted. And that's the uh, plain text input that we will be feeding in uh, to become or to make it cipher text. Let's say if it's a 64-bit plain text input we will be encrypting it with the 56 bit symmetric key to make it uh, the encrypted or cipher text uh, communication. Now, moving on to triple DES. Here, again, 64 bit plain text input, but the key will be different because if you see triple, so three times the encryption that we were using for DES. So we are using like uh, uh, the keys which could be encrypting it thrice. So the key usages which we have is encrypt, encrypt, encrypt with three times. So there are three uh, keys which we'll be using. Now here I have mentioned there's a key one because if you can see there are three keys. So the key one will leverage the plain text and encrypt it. Now there here comes the encrypted text. There's a key two. And then there is a key uh, which will be used here. Now, I think I've mentioned it wrong. It's going to be E. So I'm going to be encrypting it, this text also. Now, once there is an encryption which will be used for uh, the third text here or the third key here. Now, third key will also use the encrypted text here and it will be encrypted here again. So the, you can see that there are three alterations of encryption that are being used here. Similarly, if you can see here, there's a key one, which will be used, which is used for uh, encrypting the plain text. Now there is a play, uh, encryption, uh, encrypted text, which has come here. Key two will be used uh, in conjunction with the encrypted text, and then it will be decrypted and so on and so forth. Similarly for EEE2, there'll be two keys, the key one here, the second key here, and then there is one key here. Now, how will I understand? How will I remember it? 
Now let me go back and show you here. So here, if I take an example that how these two key key can be used, this is a plain text, and then I've used the key one to encrypt it. Now I'm going to use the key two. I'm going to be using it and then using the decryption algorithm. Then I'm going to be encrypting it again using the key one and then becomes the plain text. So there are multiple uh, iterations which are happening. The text is getting changed. And similarly, once that encryption is done, there will be different rounds like encryption, decryption that will happen. Then came the uh, IDEA. So triple test is actually very famous. Now, when it comes to IDEA or International Data Encryption Algorithm, so in the uh, it was actually uh, developed in response to the complaints which was uh, talked about uh, for uh, DES algorithm or data encryption standard that it uses insufficient uh, key length and there are problems and other uh, people are able to break it. So people were able to break it, then only we came to this particular algorithm. So like this, IDE operates on a 64-bit block itself, uh, but it can be broken down into 52 16 bit sub keys. So key can be broken down up to uh, up in a series of multiple iterations. So the sub key can then act on the input text. So sub keys will be acting on the input text, which will be Zord. Uh, if you've heard about Zord function, like and or not Zord, a Zord is basically exclusive or wherein if there are uh, true algorithm, then only it will be taking further. So this particular algorithm started using Zor functions and even in DES, there are few algorithms which used the Zor function. So if you don't know about Zoring and if you don't know about and not uh, or or, you should go back and understand. Or, and I think it's being used in the colleges, which is part of the curriculum. So Zor functions, if I have to say in one line, it returns a true value when only one of the input values is true. So if uh, there is zero, zero, it's a true function, then it returns zero. If it's zero, one or one, zero, it will return one, then only it will be true. And if it's one, one, then it will be returning zero. So that's what a Zoring function is. I not go deep into all those Zor functions, but I would say that uh, it can give you a good uh, view if you are using the Boolean uh, mathematics or if you have any questions about Boolean mathematics or uh, that particular side of it, uh, we can have a conversation after the session or you can reach out to me anytime and I can explain going in depth of each of these. So idea, uh, IDEA is capable of operating in the same five modes as DES. Like I talked about ECB, which is a uh, uh, ECP, CBC, CFB, OFB, or the counter mode, which is CTR mode. So electronic book code mode, or uh, uh, which is um, a cipher feedback mode, cipher blockchain mode, output feedback mode. Blowfish. So Blowfish uh, uses uh, the key length, which is 32 to 448. So variable key length, but the input remains the same, which is 64 bit in both size. So that's one of the difference which is with Blowfish and it's another uh, alternative to uh, DES and IDEA. So it's it's like uh, its own predecessors wherein we're using the 64-bit block but we're using the key length which is variable. So we can define what key length we want for, uh, uh, for our own uh, algorithms or encryption. And the best part about Blowfish is that uh, it's being open source by the people. So you can see that uh, if you start researching about it, there are a number of Blowfish libraries which are available for software developers, which they can use uh, to uh, for the encryption. So when it's open source, people can use it, or it's for public use, I should say that. So Skipjack was a, so Skipjack algorithm was approved for use by the US government uh, in federal information uh, processing standard, which is called FIPS. Um, so this in conjunction with escrowed encryption standard, wherein 
uh, like many other blocks that we have heard or we have seen now, like DES, uh, IDEA, or Triple S, Skipjack uh, also Skipjack also operates on the 64-bit block size of text, but it uses a 80-bit key and supports the same modes as this. But uh, uh, the problem with this is that it supports the escrow system, wherein if there are two government agencies like NIST, uh, which is National Institute of Standard and Technology, uh, and there are other departments like Department of Treasury, which holds a portion of keys. So if they come together, they will be able to provide the key. If uh, I am using Skipjack, other people, other organizations can actually provide the key. Now comes the one, one of the most important one, which is AES, that's been very vaguely used. So, uh, in October 2000, the National Inti Institute of uh, Standard and Technology announced that the uh, that we are going to be using uh, a certain algorithm or a new algorithm, which is uh, Resendel and uh, uh, AES Cipher, or when they started using it, so it allows the use of three key strengths. Have you seen the earlier ones? There was a key strength of uh, 56 bit. Yes. Then came the triple disk, which uses two kinds of keys, 112 and then uh, the other one. Uh, so the 112 and 168, 168. Now, with this, when there are three different keys, and uh, we're using a 128 block, uh, which is a bigger block than 64 bit. So 128 bit key using how many? So there are multiple rounds of encryption that can happen. So with 128, we can do the encryption 10 times, which is very difficult to attain, and then you have to decrypt it. Similarly, for 98-bit key, we can do 12 rounds of encryption. And with 256-bit key, we can do 14 rounds of encryption. So if you keep using, if we keep using the, the lengthy uh, key, the encryption will change. The encryption rounds will change. Now comes the point where how will you remember? So we'll AES is a 128 bit block size. That is like uh, the block size, which is bigger one. Even remember two fish is also 128 bit block size. And the key size for AES is are three, 128, 192, and 256. Let me go ahead. Now, what are the problems and what are the uh, what are the pros and cons of it? So there are uh, uh, pros, which is which is very fast because there's one key, and then we'll just go ahead and encrypt it, decrypt it, and the uh, the keys are also uh, the size where it can help us in fast encryption, decryption. It provides confidentiality, integrity, and authentication. And if it's a very big size of key, then it's very hard to uh, uh, break it. Remember, we can see three things here. Now, what is missing? Non-repudiation. Wherein there's only one key used by multiple parties. What could go wrong? What could be the problem? So, problem is that mm -hmm. if I'm using non-repudiation, and uh, I can say that this person has sent me the information. Now, with uh, some I cannot tell that who is sent because the key is the same for everyone. And key distribution is like a big problem that, that how will we transfer the key? If somebody will get to know about the key. And the most technically uh, simple method could be like just send it on a paper, piece of paper, or send it in a pen drive. But how about if we lose the pen drive or if we lose the key? Right. And similarly, uh, if let's say if there are 10 parties involved, if someone leaves the organization or leaves the, uh, the communication, what can what can be go wrong? What can go wrong? We'll have to change the key for everyone. So that will be a big challenge to rotate everything. An algorithm is not scalable, uh, scalable. As I told the formula wherein n n minus one by two, where if there are 10 parties. Uh, what? How many keys we will require? Forty-five keys, and if it, there are like hundred keys, and the key, the key length will go on. So to explain the one key, okay, I have one to one key. I know my key, and I, uh, you know the key. 
it's fine second person also they have a unique key it's fine there is a unique key between other people so on and but if there are more communication patterns the uh, eighth person tenth person has to talk to somebody else there has to be a new cue here goes the new key and there has to be a lot of combination of keys that we would need so uh, key generation is required which is the big problem that's when it came into picture um, now talk, we talked about that there are multiple keys we will be generated there are certain issues but there are attacks that can happen alice is sent the data and trying to encrypt it so there's an encryption channel encrypted the key uh, encrypted the data with the key but then trudy is in the middle the channel has been uh, taken over by trudy who's a vicious person and the person gets to know okay this is the key that they are using and that person forges the data and sends it to bob what bob will think it's being sent by alice but what is the problem or if the message is being deleted bob will never get to know so what is asymmetric key and why are we talking about it why are we saying that this should be used this should not be used or how it all started and what are the different names to it so as asymmetric key says the keys are not same there are two different keys and it's also called public key cryptography now why it's key what why it's called public key cryptography and the asymmetric uh, symmetric one is called uh, the private key because you are there are two keys one is public which is known to the whole world or the people who are in communication at the same time the there is a private key which is known to me only if i am communicating with someone my key will be known to me unless i'm sharing it with someone it's like I know my password, and nobody else knows my password. Only the person who's uh, who's supposed to decrypt the information will know it, and vice versa. Vice versa. Why I'm saying when there is an encryption, decryption happens. Both keys can encrypt data. Both keys can decrypt the data. And I'm going to be explaining them why we are saying that. So, when there is a public key which is known to all or known to all the communicating parties. and in the private key which is known only to the person who is going to decrypt the data or who is going to know about that data and i'm saying again that who is going to know about that data so uh, let's say you know, i have to talk to bob or alice has to talk to bob so uh, and uh, the information should be confidential to bob uh, alice knows bob's public key anyone can know public key but the decryption will only happen with the private key if uh, if alice encrypts the data with bob's public key she cannot decrypt it she cannot change the text she might she would know that this was the information which was used to encrypt it but she cannot decrypt again so the the secret text will be there and then bob will be decrypting it with his own private key so encryption key which is public decryption key which will be private that will be the funda here now similar way if there is a plain text which is being encrypted with the bob public key and cipher text which has come now bob's private key will be used to decrypt it now what is the formula with all of that how will i find with how many number of keys that we need the simple formula is n into p because there are two parties so we will need only two keys for that two communication and um uh, there are uh, different algorithms which are there like we had for um, uh, it's, it's a symmetric key similarly there are algorithms which are there for asymmetric key as well so rsa is very well known that it was developed by people uh, who are uh, Uh, right so these are the surnames of the three people who actually developed it and then they started using uh, it for the commercial purpose and they they made a company for that which is rsa security so 
RSA is Rivers, Shamir, and Edelman. These are the three people who, uh, who started off with that. Then Elliptic Curve, uh, curve Crypto System, Diffie Hellman, Algamel, and Digital Signature Algorithm. Now, what is Diffie Hellman? And uh, uh, what exactly is different than others? So the first, uh, the first group to address the shortfalls of symmetric key cryptography. Uh, so it was given to Diffie Hellman, Whitefield Diffie, and Martin Hellman. So who worked on the problem and end up ending? Uh, so they ended up developing a new algorithm, which was using two different keys, which was Diffie Hellman. So how, if we have to understand, uh, we can say that uh, I am speaking with uh, X person and would like to communicate over encrypted channel by using Diffie Hellman. So we both generate a private and public key pair. Both have to have uh, a private and public key pair. If I have to establish a communication, so I will have my public key, I will have my private key. You will have your public key, you will have your private key. So what I will do is that if I have to send you some information and only you can uh, decrypt it, I will actually encrypt it using your public key. And you will be, uh, you will be using it to decrypt it. Now, if I put them through the Diffie-Hellman algorithm, so uh, what will happen is if there are public and private key that I'm using, uh, let's say I'm using I my public key and or your public key and my private key, and uh, you are using my public key and your private key, the, if we pass it through Diffie-Hellman, the, the value that will be coming, it will be the similar. Confusing. Sometimes it is. Trust me, all these algorithms are confusing, but it's uh, good to know wherein if I have my public key or uh, if I have my private key, your public key will give the same value. Your uh, private key and my public key will be giving me the same value with Diffie Hellman. I should have made a picture. I think next time I'll make a picture of it and describe that. So Algamel is a public key algorithm like uh, we have uh, Diffie Hellman and that can be used for digital signatures, encryptions and key exchange. Now it is based not only the difficulty of uh, the factoring large numbers, but uh, what we can do is we can actually uh, use the discrete logarithm and uh, we can raise different, we can use different integers in this. So if, if you can see the uh, equation on the screen, BK is equal to G. Now, what is B and G? Now, B and G are the integers. Then K is the, uh, uh, the key value or the logarithm which is used in the equation. So when the numbers are large, logarithm can be difficult to attain. That's when uh, the, it's, it's basically extension of Diffie L, but then uh, it, it is really, really uh, difficult to attain the performance with this. Because if we keep increasing the integers and the key value pair or the logarithm will also increase, then it will be different or uh, it will be a problem with the performance. If we compare it with the other algorithms, it will be different to attain or difficult to attain, not different, but difficult to attain. Then came RSA. So RSA named after its inventors, as I mentioned, and it's worldwide, uh, worldwide de, de facto standard and can be used for digital signatures, key exchange and encryption. And it came into existence in 1978 at MIT. Uh, and the security of this algorithms comes from the difficulty of factoring large numbers uh, from prime numbers. Think about you using large prime numbers and you're factoring it. How difficult it will be to find out if there are smaller numbers, let's say 15, and I'm factoring it, what can, what can be the number that will come on? It can be a factor of one, three, five, but if there are three bigger prime numbers, it will be very, very difficult to find, find out. So if I have to explain it, there are two random numbers that we can select, uh, A or B, or uh, could be uh, any other number, let's say P and Q, and generate the product of it. Now, from that, we will go ahead and factor them. Now, once you factor them, there will be a key that generating. So what we can say that uh, the original prime numbers can be discarded securely 
once the key is generated. So we have will have our public key and private key. So what you can do is if you want to understand best RSA, you can generate the public and key and private key using a putty, which is a tool that being that's being used. Uh, that um, and uh, uh, we can leverage that. Now, well, I don't understand all these formulas, and but they look simple enough. Why couldn't someone break these small formulas and uncover this encryption keys? Maybe someone will one day. But then, as the as we are growing, uh, or uh, as we talk about cryptanalysis, are working on it. RSA algorithm may be broken someday, but not today for sure. So if we were to figure out how to quickly and more easily factor large numbers into their original prime numbers, all of these cards will fall down for sure. But there, RSA goes to the next level where the prime numbers are factored at a different level and the keys are being used. So uh, what are the advantages of all these algorithms and what we talk about, the, uh, especially this the, uh, asymmetric key system? Here, there is two keys, private key and public key. And I don't have to do anything. I don't have to share my private key. I only have to share my public key with everyone. And what can be the thing? Scalability. Scalability issues were there with metric key that I have to have hundreds and thousands of keys. And especially if someone leaves the, the chat, if there are hundred key, I have to change uh, I have to change the key for everyone. And I have to uh, re-encrypt the data. But here, if someone leaves, I just disable the key and that's all. I will stop communicating with that person because the person can only decrypt the data. If I'm sending it to one person, then only person can actually um, read that. And it also helps with non-repudiation. Like uh, if I have to use the two keys, the decryption will only happen with the person who has that particular key. So if authentication is the most important security service to a sender, then uh, we can actually encrypt it with the private key. Now, this provide assurance to the receiver that only person who could have encrypted the data is the individual who has the position of that private key. Now, there, is, there are other things, confidentiality. Now, how to maintain the confidentiality that in, if I am encrypting the data with the private key, here I am again emphasizing that we can encrypt the data with a private key. But if I am encrypting the data with my private key, who can dec decrypt? Who has my public key? Now that's specifically being used to check if I am the right person who is sending the data. And sometimes if I have to match up the data with certain uh, values, that only this particular value has to be ma matched or there is a checksum that is there. There's a message digest which is there. So these are some uh, differences which are there, whereas uh, in symmetric key, there's only one key used. Asymmetric, there are two keys used. In key exchange, symmetric, there is a big problem. We have to do out of band key sharing, whether we are giving it via email, which could be read by someone, whether we are sending it via paper, we are sending using uh, uh, other mechanisms, we're using Diffie-Hellman, or we're using some other mechanism to share the keys. But there are some good features and we can do it for bulk encryption. We can use it um, for confidentiality. In asymmetric, we can attain confidentiality, authentication, and non-repudiation. Now, if there are two parties involved in symmetric, authentication can be attained, but non-repudiation, no, not happening. So there are people started using hybrid mechanism wherein first there will be a, a communication channel which will be established using asymmetric keys now i know you're the right person once the channel is established then we will start sharing we will share our symmetric key and we will encrypt and decrypt the data using symmetric key which is more faster and that's when people started uh, leveraging these two technologies so here, if Paul wants to read or Paul wants to talk to Bill first, um, Paul, we Paul will actually encrypt the data using Bill's private key and send it to Bill. And Bill will read and we will, Bill will know, okay, this is the right person. Let's go ahead and start talking to each other. And Bill will encrypt the data or a symmetric key using Paul's public key. 
Now, who can decrypt the data and who can read the information? Only uh, uh, Paul. So, symmetric key will be transferred to Paul. Now, what is the hybrid model? Hybrid is when we are using two different algorithms together, asymmetric and symmetric together. That's called hybrid. When we are hybriding, we are mixing two things. And this term will use, uh, we, uh, you can hear it uh, at multiple places, like hybrid cloud, hybrid this thing, where two different things are being used. So here, uh, we are using asymmetric first uh, to establish a channel, know that that's the right person to talk to, then transfer the key itself using the sim uh, asymmetric uh, algorithm, and then talk, talk on the symmetric key channel which is way faster. I would say 100 times faster or thousands of times faster. That's why people leverage both of them together. And especially if we have to talk about uh, the, uh, the website communication, yes, that's being used. And then comes the hashing function. Hashing functions, I would just touch upon from the high level perspective, wherein hashing function, uh, basically when you have an encryption, but then you use uh, to convert it to some other, uh, form and it maintains the integrity for sure. It provides authentication, non repudiation, and you sign it the whole value. So, here uh, encryption can be decrypted, but hashing functions are one way functions wherein you just hash a value and there will be a value that will come to you and um, that will be irreversible. But there are hash functions which, which people could break. So if there is a MD5 hash, and you know this is the hash value, there are hash calculators which are available online. If there is an MD5 hash, okay. This is the hash that I can see, it looks like MD5. MD5. Can I go online and check whether it can be, uh, what could be the value of it? Okay, let's go back and check. So uh, example to give you, if you use password as password, which is P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D or P-A-S-S-W-0-R-D, there will be a value that will come, and Always remember, hash will give you unique value. If there is a message that will always have, you, even if you change one single alphabet into that, the hash value will change. There will be a unique value. And that's how when people were able to uh, find that how to break the hash and what could, go, what could be the value, what, how to calculate the hash, then there are new hash that came into picture. SHA-2, SHA-256, and there are, that keeps on increasing. And the, the bit hash value kept on increasing. Now, let's talk about message integrity, a digital signature. We talked about uh, asymmetric key. Now, when we talked about asymmetric key, we talked about that there is a key which is being used to encrypt the message. Um, Alice, uh, or uh, uh, Alice used Bob's private, uh, public key to encrypt the message and Bob uses private key. But here in digital signatures, I want to check the authenticity of Bob. So, or Bob has to send, an, uh, send a message, how I can do that? So, I will sign, I will sign a message with my private key and then send it over to you. And how can you check it? If I can use your public key to check the message, that means, yes, this is the person who you are, unless you've shared your key with anyone. So here, it specifies that if the Bob has to share a message, Bob, uh, sorry, Bob has to use his private key. Now, let me show you a working example. There is a digital sign message. The hash function will, will be used. There is the digest come up. Now, if I'm decrypting it with the public key, because that's what we are using for digital signatures. That's what digital signatures are used for. But I want to make sure the person who has given me the data, the data is exact the same. And the hash value is the same. Digest value is the same. So if I'm decrypting it with the public key, the digest that will come up, it has to be exact identical. If there are tempting which has been done in the middle, uh, then we will get to know the digest will change. Now, this is the working wherein Bob sends a digitally signed message that has a large message that has been hashed. Uh, we have used the hash function 
we created the digital then we came up now it has gone to alice alice verifies the signatures and integrity but how does it check now there's a hash function that's being used and what she did she used bob's public key to check what is that and then the, the digest value is the same or the value is the same key takeaways from the session that if we have to attain or we have to attain confidentiality message has to be encrypted if we have to attain integrity message has to be hashed because hash value will change and you'll get to know that data has been changed somewhere if a message needs to be designed which provide authentication and no repudiation if i have sent a message which digitally signed i can never deny that i have not sent it that's why digital signatures are being used at the government firms and even over emails a lot of confidential emails you will see that uh, that is being using digital signatures specifically and it's also to maintain integrity now if a message is can be encrypted and digitally signed what can it can provide it can provide confidentiality authentication non repudiation and integrity at the same time so encrypt digitally sign in nobody can say that i have not sent you the data and i in, in the encryption provides okay yes this is the right person asymmetric key we can use it asymmetric key algorithm that we can use it and we can use the data signatures uh the this is how you can reach me you can reach me on twitter uh this is my twitter handle my dms are open feel free to drop me a note this is my linkedin you can search uh, by vandana hyphen verma if you, if you go to in.com and then search this you will be able to find it feel free to drop me a note um, i'll be more than happy to answer your questions